we live in a world where people break their promises, but we can always count on God to be true to his word. Even when our friends fail us, God is faithful to fulfill his covenants. Today on Truth For Life, Alistair Begg examines a promise God made to a childless couple that he would transform their union and make them a great nation. The message is called The Promised Kingdom, and our text is in the book of Genesis. What is a covenant? It's the coming together of a stated and continuing relationship between two parties who previously were apart from each other. The coming into existence of a stated and continuing relationship between two parties who previously were apart from each other. This is, this is why marriage is a covenant. Marriage is not a contract. Marriage is not something that has been devised in time, uh, dreamt up by people. No, it is a covenant. It's not a unilateral covenant in the way in which God unilaterally exercises his initiative with Noah. It is a mutual covenant between a husband and wife, but they covenant together, they come together, and the people say, and the two will become one. And it is stated, and it is obvious, and it is public. They came prior uh, as single individuals. They walked down the aisle, united in a covenant relationship. Now, without exception, the whole human race is involved in wickedness. Outwardly, it was clear in the face of the earth. Inwardly, the thoughts of the hearts of men and women were deceitful, and equally they were in the same position. So why does God do this? because of his plan to have a people that are his very own. He's putting together a people. And if he hadn't had Noah and the ark, then there would be no people, because the flood would have taken everybody out. So he puts together a people in the safety of the ark. And the people who were not in the safety of the ark, what did they do? They ignored the preacher of righteousness. Noah goes amongst the people and he says, Listen, God is going to judge the world. There's going to be a flood. And they said, You're nuts. It doesn't even rain. What do you mean a flood? You're a crazy man, Noah. I don't understand you. Well, I understand a little of how he must have felt. People say, you're crazy. You don't honestly believe the Adam and Eve stuff, do you? You're crazy. You don't honestly believe that a Galilean carpenter is the answer to the sins of the world. You're crazy. You don't believe that Jesus is going to return again for a people that are his very own. Oh, no. We, 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 thank you, but we'll just get on the way we are. Amazing, isn't it, really? Now, this covenant is established with Noah... God gives him a big, huge sign, a rainbow, and uh, he promises he's going to preserve creation, and he's never going to again destroy it by a flood. I'm going to skip Abram for a moment, if you don't mind. I'm sure he doesn't mind. God makes a covenant with Moses. We're not going to get into it. He says, you're my people, the Israelites. You'll be my special people, and I'm going to give you a sign as well. And that's the sign of the Sabbath. And God is moving all of this covenant picture forward because the Israelites, as we see as we go forward with our study, broke their covenant obligation. God enters into judgment on them, but he promises them, and primarily through his prophet Jeremiah, that there's going to be a new and a better covenant— And that new and better covenant will lead to a changed heart, a universal knowledge of God, and complete forgiveness. And it will be by his death on the cross that Jesus inaugurates that new covenant. That's why in the Last Supper, Jesus says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood for the remission of sins. Now, those people understood this. They said, you mean to say that you are going to bring people into a relationship with yourself as a result of your death on the cross? Jesus says, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Indeed, every other covenant points forward, and there is, in a sense, only one covenant that is ultimately embodied in the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. Now, the covenant with Abram, of course, is foundational, and that's why we have Uh, read from Genesis 12 this morning. And the sign of the covenant with Abram, of course, is circumcision. 
Now, we're going to end here, so you can sort of take a deep breath and say, okay, we're sort of on the final stretch, and let me explain this as best I can. In Cain and Abel, you've got sin and judgment, and grace is revealed in the fact that Cain has a mark put upon him, and although he is exiled, he's not abandoned. In the judgment of sin, in the mortality of Genesis chapter 5, you have sin, you have judgment, which is death, and then you have grace, which is revealed in the fact that Enoch was not because God took him. And then in the flood, you have sin, you have the judgment of God in the flood, and then you have grace in Noah and in those who joined him. And then the fourth element in that was the Tower of Babel, right, in Genesis chapter 11. But when you read Genesis chapter 11, you have sin and you have judgment. You have the people turning their back on God. You have the judgment of God when he says, okay, I'm going to scatter these people. I'm going to diversify their languages. I'm going to put them all over the place. But there's no indication of grace. Genesis 11 ends, sin, judgment, where's grace? Well, you have to wait a chapter, chapter 12, and a generation before God comes to repair what is devastated in chapter 11. God is coming now to Abraham and giving him promises to reverse the effect of his judgment that is there in Babel. God separates creation. That's Genesis 11. Now, in chapter 12, his grace becomes apparent. Instead of just saying, okay, scatter and get out of my sight, the way a parent may sometimes say, listen, why don't all of you get out of the kitchen? In fact, get out of the house, get out of the neighborhood. You never felt that way at all. All right, so just, just go. God might equally have said, you know what, I'm just going to scatter you and be done with you. But no, he, he wasn't and he couldn't because of the nature of who he is. And in Genesis 12, he comes to this man, to a pagan man called Abraham. You see, Abraham wasn't some fellow who was reading his Bible on a daily basis, you know, a really nice guy. Abraham was just a guy. And God comes to Abraham and he says to him, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. And I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now listen, my friends, because this is crucial. Here in the first three verses of Genesis 12, you have really the first indication, the first expression of the gospel promise, of the good news of what God is doing in his world. John Stott says of this, it may be truly said, without exaggeration, that not only the rest of the Old Testament, but the whole of the New Testament is an outworking of these promises of God. In other words, if you want to understand your Bible, if you want to understand the Old Testament, and you want to understand the New Testament, then you need to realize that essentially what you have is a fantastic exposition throughout history of the promises of God made to his servant Abraham. Genesis 12, 1 to 3, is the text that the rest of the Bible expounds. Nothing particularly special about Abraham, chosen not on account of his goodness, but chosen on account of God's grace. And what are the elements in the covenant that God makes with him? Well, first of all, it has to do with people. The descendants of Abraham will become a great nation that will be God's own people. Genesis 17, 7. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Now, one of the things we're going to interact with this evening 
is the distinction between promise and fulfillment. Those of you who've been in the early studies know that what you have in the Bible is constantly moving between promise and fulfillment. And on the road to ultimate fulfillment, you will find partial fulfillment. And the promises that God makes to Abraham are partially fulfilled in the nation of Israel and are ultimately fulfilled in the universal application of the gospel. I'm going to give you one reference to set you on the right direction regarding this, and we'll come back to it as time goes on. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 29. I'll read it for you. You can make a note of it to study at your leisure. Paul writes to the church in Galatia, and he says, you are all sons of God. And how is a person a son of God or a daughter of God? He uses the phraseology generically there. You're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So there is neither Jew nor Greek. That doesn't mean Jews and Greeks don't exist. There is neither slave nor free. That doesn't mean there aren't employees and employers. There is neither male nor female. That does not mean that we live in a society where there is no longer male and female. What it means is that the distinctions of ethnicity, the distinctions of gender, and the distinctions of status are neutralized in the gospel. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, here's the kicker. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What promise? The promise in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. My dear friends, if you could get just a tiny glimpse of the immensity of this, if each of us could, the way in which the gospel is presented to us, the way in which we tend to respond to it and so on, makes it seem as if it was some kind of immediate and existential experience in a moment of time because this happened or that happened, and that we are, if you like, unhinged from the totality of all that is preceded and follows from it. But nothing could be further from the truth. If you are in Christ today, then the promise that God made to Abraham, if you like, has your name on it. And behind the promise he made to Abraham in all of eternity, that has your name on it. My name from the palms of his hands, eternity cannot erase. For there it is marked in indelible grace. For by God's grace I am a citizen of heaven. I serve a king called Christ. I'm moving towards the place of his appointing. I live under his rule of the Word of God. I enjoy his blessing, and I share that with Jews and Gentiles and people from an Islamic background and folks who've been redeemed out of atheism and agnosticism. And Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Why? Because he is fulfilling his promise to Abraham. It is immense. You are not a speck of stellar dust floating somewhere in this time-space capsule, lost in the 21st century, moving towards who knows where. But you are a child of the King, patterned and planned and suggested and brought to fruition. Oh, it ought to bring our chins up off our chest. Oh, it ought to make us fall before God and worship Him. Why would He ever do this? Why Noah? Why Abraham? Why you and why me? There is no explanation except his grace. His grace. If it were, if it were human invitation and human implementation, hundreds of people would have become Christians last Sunday. I made it as clear as you possibly can. There are three ways you can view your life. 
You're part of a chance universe heading for oblivion. Or you're held in the grip of a blind impersonal force called fate. Or you may be the child of a creator God who loves you in Christ and you may know him. And people went out the door, just out the door, back to their Easter lunch. Those same people, if I had presented to them three possibilities for financial investment and gave them a dog and another dog and a good one, they would have said, we take the good one. Of course, leave the dogs behind. But I explained to them, chance, oblivion, or Jesus. And they walked out the door, telling me what? Telling me that unless the grace of God works in the heart of an individual, you can speak to your blue in the face. Therefore, I preach to a congregation that metaphorically every Sunday has its fingers in its ears and its eyes over its face. And I could not, in a million Sundays, pull your fingers out or take your scales off your eyes. But God can, and God does, and he does, and that's our confidence. And that's the people he's putting together. Let me ask you again. Is your heart the sphere of God's rule? Do you live under his rule? Do you enjoy his blessing? That is the question of the ages. That is the question. And the land that he gives them in Canaan is just a picture of all that heaven is going to be. It was a wonderful place and flowing with milk and honey and so on. And it spoke of his blessing. Spoke of his blessing. I look forward to tonight when I can try and clarify some of the stuff I have to leave. But let me give to you our summary statement that we've tried to and here's, here's your line, incidentally, if you want to be able to make sense of the Bible. The kingdom of God. What is it? God's people in God's place under God's blessing. That kingdom is patterned in the creation of the world. Who are the people, Adam and Eve? Where's the place? It's the garden. What is his blessing and rule? It's his word and relationship. So what in the world is the problem now? Why are we as we are? Well, because the kingdom is spoiled. Who then are the people of God? Nobody. Where are we? Banished. Do we know God's rule? No, we're disobedient. Do we know his blessing? No, we live under his curse. Well, is he just going to leave us high and dry? No, he's made a promise. He made it to Abraham. And who will the people be? Abram's descendants. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, then you are the seed of Abraham and heirs of the promise. And where were they going? Well, they were going to Canaan. And what were they going to do? They were going to live under his law and his tutelage. And they were going to enjoy the blessing of his presence. Can you imagine? I don't know if I can. How hard it must have been for Abram to believe this stuff. <laughs> I mean, there is no way that Abram can believe this stuff apart from God's grace. Abraham? Yeah. I want you to head out. Um, where? Don't worry about where. I just want you to head out. Hmm. Abram, your wife Sarah, she's going to have a baby. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure. You come back tonight, we're going to see Sarah, 90 years old, coming off the back of a camel at the local hospital with her walker. <laughs> and one of those nice red-coated people comes out and says, Ha, ah, Mrs. Abraham, can I help you? The geriatric ward, is it? She said, No, obstetrics. <laughs> She's nuts. And her husband, whoo! See, the future of the kingdom wasn't just difficult. It was impossible. It was naturally impossible. Unless God 
in his vivifying power, was to intervene and grant life where there is only the deadness of a womb, then how in the world can the promise be fulfilled? Well, how does God add to the company of his people? By the same life-giving power. And what is the story of the journey of his people? It's the same story as Abram. You got the promises of God, and you trust them. That's the story so far. We'll pick it up later. The Promised Kingdom. That's the title of our message today from Alistair Begg and Truth for Life. In just a minute, Alistair will conclude with prayer, so please keep listening. This message is part of a unique series called The Kingdom of God. In this study, Alistair is taking us on a sweeping journey through the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation so we can see the unfolding story of God's kingdom. We hope this series is already deepening your understanding of God's plan for his people from the beginning of time. To go along with this study, we want to recommend to you a book that tracks with Alistair's teaching. It's a book titled God's Big Picture. This book follows with the same eight stages of God's kingdom that Alistair is describing in this series. We've already seen the perished kingdom and the promised kingdom. There are five more stages still ahead. We'd love to send you a copy of this book so you can read more about the overarching themes of God's kingdom and how you fit into that story. We invite you to request your copy of God's Big Picture as our way of saying thanks when you donate to support Truth For Life. Ask for your copy of the book when you give today. Call 888-588-7884. That's 888-588-7884. Or if it's easier, you can donate and request God's Big Picture online at truthforlife.org. If you'd prefer to mail your donation, write to Truth For Life, P.O. Box 39 Cleveland, Ohio, 44139. Now to close with prayer, here's Alistair. Father, we thank you that the Bible's not just a rag bag of ideas thrown together over a period of time by folks who wanted to foist a religion on people, but that there is a cohesive structure to the vastness of the Bible— And we bow underneath its awesome story today. Come and search our hearts that we might, in our lives, be the very sphere of your kingly rule. Some of us are so stuck on ourselves, sit on our own throne, tell everybody what we've done, how good we are, what we've made, where we're going. But we know that our lives are spoiled. We try and unspoil them by doing stuff. But even when we do stuff, that's spoiled. And we need to come humbly to you and acknowledge that only you can forgive sin. Only you can fill the empty void of a life without you. That we do need a king to reign over our lives, a king who's gracious and kind and who loves to bless. So come, Lord Jesus Christ, and claim your people today and exercise your kingly rule. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with all who believe today and forevermore. Amen. I'm Bob Lapine, hoping you can join us again tomorrow when we'll continue discovering the unfolding narrative that runs through all of Scripture. The Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.